listen to this. Listen, listen, listen. As Sister Tammy and Brother Daniel, Daniel and Brother Ben ushered in the presence of God. Think about this. I want us not just to do the traditional praise God. I want you to think about we're going to give God a praise because the anointing is here already. Yes. And we just didn't yes. come to church just to come to church. We could have been doing a lot of things. But if God woke you up this morning, he really did. It wasn't your alarm clock. And if you're breathing and you don't have to take any pain pills and you're walking, even if you've got to take pain pills and you're still here and God is still working under, under the situation. Listen, God is so good. I want you, us, to give God a praise that would go to 20, go all the way down 20. Everybody would know that we are here in this place. And the reason why I want you to give God a praise is not because just because I'm saying it, because he is just so good. David said, I was glad, I was glad when they said, let us come to God. us. He's going to use us in this earth. And we love Jesus so much. We love him so much. And the people of God, as we, as pastor been talking about the churches, it came to mind that God said he's, uh, he's going to first judge his church. And after that, as they sing the song, uh, the uh, song, sing it, song to song, he's holding back the darkness. After his church get right, we're going to have to pray for others that don't know yeah. Jesus because yeah. the judgment of God is going to come. This is very important, and God is going to use us in this season. If you want it to be used, God will use you. Yeah. Listen, God died for everybody, yeah. just not for one person, just not for the pastor, preachers, or whatever. God died for everybody, and you yeah. somebody in Jesus, and he want to use you. Yeah. So you need to avail yourself. As these work messages come forth with the churches, put yourself in there. Put yourself in there and make sure that you get yourself right because we all have to go one way. And when we meet Jesus, we want, we want him to say, well done. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Not just that we made it into heaven. We want to have a slew of people. You know, yeah. have a big party. Yeah. You yeah. invite, oh my God, a lot of people. We want, we're going to have a party. So we want to take as many people as we can. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? As we get ready for the word of God, as our pastor comes, let's just praise God for how God is going to use him and continue to use him. Yes, Lord. Let's give God a praise as he's come. As he comes. <laughs> the Lord again this day. Yeah. If you really believe that, can we stand to our feet and give God a praise? Hallelujah! Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Feel the help coming there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God, thank God, thank God for Jesus. Isn't he worthy? Yeah. Hallelujah. Go ahead and give somebody, well, you can't give him a high five. <laughs> give him an elbow pump. <laughs> In the spirit. Go ahead and take your seats. God bless you there. Uh, 
Uh, Sister Chandra, you did have the surgery, I assume. Look at God. God, we pray for Sister Sandra. Yeah. Chandra, she's here. So obviously, the surgery was a success. Thank God for that. Oh, man. Praise God. Good to have you here with us and everything. And I'm so glad and thankful that everybody's able to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. And, I, and now, is, is, is trusting him? him, him yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, listen, I was looking for a, a lady a lot older, but uh, she seems to have... Looks like she's her sister. So I'm Tressel's mom, stand up, will you? Okay, hello. Look how good she looks, y'all. Unbelievable. Hey, looks like your best friend or somebody. You got some good, strong genes, sister. Good to have you. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Hey, Amen. So good to have you. But we're going to go ahead and get ready to prepare ourselves for this morning's tithes and offerings. If you need an offering envelope, if you'll just simply lift your hand up, we'll be sure to give, give uh, you an off offering envelope in your hand if that is the case. And God has been good to many of us. And those who you don't feel like he's been that good to, then ask yourself, have I been given tithes on a regular basis? And if you have, then you can expect to receive a blessing. You can expect increase in your life. You can expect it. You can expect it. You should, in fact, inspect it. Because the Bible tells us that if we give, it shall be given unto us in good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. There are times, even as tithers, that when you give, you'll still be tested in your faith. Don't think that because you are having tests that you're cursed. Do you realize a lot of times when you go through different tests, that in a lot of times in disguise is a blessing about to happen for you? Because that lets you know before the, the increase comes or before the promotion comes, you got to pass this certain test. And when you pass that particular test, then the promotion comes. So when you go through whatever it is, I don't care how horrendous it may seem like it is and things you may not understand, I think everybody in this thing called life goes through that. Welcome to Life 101. But this is when we have to trust God blindly. Yes. Even when we can't trace him, we still have to trust God. You have to exercise your faith. Yes. This is where faith really counts. When you don't see certain things come to pass as quick as you thought it should come to pass. This is when your faith has to be exercised. Listen, how do you know how well you've studied the test unless you take the test and pass it? So your faith is going to be tested. Listen, faith that can't be tested cannot be trusted. Your faith has to be tested in order for it to be trusted. So God will test you in areas sometimes of your finances, sometimes in relationships when it comes to husbands and wives and their children and getting along with kids. Sometimes kids rebel and all types of things happen in life. But just understand it's a test. God tests us to bless us. Remember that. He tests us simply to bless us, to promote us. So right now, we're going to ask if you can hold those offering envelopes up before the Lord in his presence. We're going to pray for the blessing of Abraham to come upon you, your family, everyone connected to you, simply because you are a tither. The Bible says, bring ye the tithes into the storehouse. You know, and he says, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, and see if I won't open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing until you won't even have room enough to receive it. Then he goes on to say, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. The devourer is anything sent from the devil to devour or to take away your earnings or your income or your increase. That is considered to be what we call the devourer. So let's lift those gifts up before the Lord as we pray. And let me just say this, those of you that are watching by streaming video if you're desirous of being a part of this blessing and if you like to give to this particular ministry you can simply do so by <clears throat> writing out whatever amount you want to write out to but make sure you make it out to rpm that's restoration power ministry and you can send it to p.o box 594 <clears throat> winston georgia 30187 all right let's just pray right now <clears throat> father we thank you for these gifts that we lift up before your presence we ask that you breathe your presence upon these gifts, Lord, and bring increase to our lives, God, as we expect you to, Lord, bless us as we've released this seed by faith. This is just a simple seed, but God, everything concerning your kingdom starts with the seed principle. It starts off small, but it increases, Lord, and it multiplies. And God, everything that you give us, you don't give us the final product. You always give it to us in seed form where there is process. 
We ask that you breathe upon these seeds right now, Lord, as we've given back to you that which you've blessed us with, concerning the tithe with this hope which is holy and the offering, Father. We ask that you would get us out of debt. Lord, get us from the rears of any bills that may be uh, we're behind on or whatever. Catch us up, Father. Breathe upon our gift. And Lord, let increase flow through our hands, Lord, in every part of our lives. Let it be that everyone that is connected to us will feel that same blessing trickle down to them. Father, we're so careful to give all glory, thanks, praise, and honor to you for everything you have in store for us. And we just thank you for it in advance. These blessings and prayers we do ask in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord in our giving and our praise singers and come and sing, and then I'll be back with the word. Amen. Amen. This song is a very old song, and it's just a simple one phrase song. So if you all desire so to sing with us, we welcome you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. This is the song that if you're going through anything, I need you all to just think about how good God has been to you. Up until this point, he did nothing else. Do you all know you're just really blessed. Yeah. 
Come on, you don't have to stop there. Let's continue to shout and praise God and give his name glory. Thanks and praise. If you love the Lord, stand to your feet, somebody, and give him glory right now. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. God, we praise your wonderful name. We lift you up. We magnify your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Holy Spirit. Step into this place and have your way, God. Have your way. Breathe upon us right now, God. Breathe your breath upon us right now, Holy Spirit. Let the glory of God fall in this place right now. Hallelujah. Lord, we take authority over all the demonic spirits of this world. We bind them and submit them underneath our feet where they belong in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. God, we ask that the angels of God come by and protect us from all four corners of this building right now. God, bless everyone that hears this message today, Lord Jesus. Anoint me as the vessel, God, as I open my mouth to speak on your behalf, to speak on your behalf, God. Fill us with the glory of God, Jesus. Bring us to the next level we need to be at, Father. Let your glory encamp around about us, oh God. Lord God, work out problems in our lives. Solve them, Jesus. Let them fizzle, God. Open those doors in our lives that no man can close, God. Close those doors in our lives, God, that no man can open. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your signs and wonders being manifested in our midst on this day. God, we're so careful to give all glory, thanks, praise, and honor. Lord, I bind every hindering spirit in the name of Jesus. Let the glory of God flood this place, Father. I bless your name, and I praise you for it. All the results go to you, God. Have your way, Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Go ahead, if you will, take your seats, everybody. This is a good, good day that you've come on. And I believe God's got some things in store for you today through his word. I am literally excited about what he's going to do. And it humbles my heart every time I stand behind the sacred pulpit to know that God chose me to be the vessel to deliver this message through. That's a humbling experience. I've been a Christian now for 44 years of my life. And I'm here to tell you I don't regret one day, not even one day. I was telling my wife, I tell her often, I said, man, I just tell you, baby, I thank God so much that I know Jesus Christ, I don't know what to do. Amen. I don't know what I would have done this far without the Lord in my life. Amen. I don't know how many of you all feel, but it's in Jesus Amen. that I literally live. Amen. It's in him that I literally move, and it's in him that I literally have my being. Amen. The closer you get to God, the more you will realize the same thing. Amen. The more you'll understand that it's not all about you, it's all about him. Come on. You're just a vessel he wants to use yes. through. Like he wants to transcend his glory through you as yes. a vessel. Yes. And God can use anybody oh, yeah. and anything if oh, he yeah. so desires. Amen? Yes. Amen. That's why it humbles my heart every time I get behind this pulpit to know that he's chosen me, an imperfect vessel. Hallelujah. Yet, for the glory of God, the perfect glory of God to flow through. That's why I believe, without a doubt, you'll be blessed today when you hear this message today. Amen. Amen. As you know, we've been preaching a series now entitled The Seven Churches of Revelation or The Seven Churches of Asia. And we're on the sixth church today. Yeah. We've been moving quite along. Amen? Amen. We're on the sixth church, and this is the church of Philadelphia. Yeah. The church of Philadelphia. Now, Jesus wrote a letter to seven different churches. I told you that these were little churches in what we call Asia Minor, which is today modern-day Turkey. That's where it is today. If you would look it up geographically speaking on a map, you'll find that Turkey is there where it used to be called Asia Minor. And these particular six churches or seven churches uh, represent the totality or the completion of the body of Christ. These are not the only churches that Jesus Christ had established. These seven were the ones that he chose to write letters to, right in what they call the postal route, where the post, the, where the mail would be traveled back in those days and delivered. It was right in that same region that, the, that you would find these seven churches of Asia. And these churches were literal churches back in the time of Christ, but yet at the same time, Jesus said in the book of Revelation that these things must, number one, shortly come to pass, which means these were letters of hope, letters of encouragement to those Christians 
currently in that day that we're going through agonizing pain and suffering from different uh, parts, portions of the world because of their religious beliefs in Jesus Christ. They were killed, I mean, tragically died. I mean, they were sawn asunder, murdered, stoned, you know, left for dead, stabbed, beaten. Uh, stones were crushed on them. They were thrown to the lion's den and so forth. I mean, all kind of things, burned alive. You know, I mean, you name it, all because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were even given opportunity before these specific traumatic experiences would come upon them to de uh, deny or recant their belief in Jesus. Amen. They were able to say, Lord, I, I, I mean, listen, Jesus, who is he? I, I don't know him. And they would have caused them to live. That would have bought them time. They would have lived and survived. Easily, you could have just done that and repented. That's how most people think, oh, God, I'm sorry for denying you. You know, at least I'm still alive. No, they said, I'm not going to deny him. And the more they persecuted the church, the more the church grew. How do you explain that? Amen. Seems to me that the more they were persecuted, the more it's time to book and run away and get out of Dodge. But instead, the church grew the more they were persecuted. You got to understand, when you are faithful to God, Amen. and when you hold your faith is strong and you take this thing for real and you stand your ground for Jesus Christ. Yeah. All of heaven is behind you. Child of God, you are never alone. It may feel like you're alone. That's where you have to believe through faith, which is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you cannot even see. Yeah. You got to know you got a whole terrain behind you. You got a whole host of folks yes. behind you, yes. backing you up, child of God, yes. because you're never alone. Listen, that's why the Bible says, if God be for you, he is more than the whole world is against you. Come on, when it comes to child of God, we have to take a stand, even if it means life or death. Amen. You've got to take a stand. And the stronger you stand, the more support you have for Jesus, the more powerful you become, the more potent God's power resides within you, the more demon spirits recognize who you are, the more the angels of God in heaven, which glow, which look over the balance of glory every now and then, and they tap into the things down here on planet Earth, the more they excel in strength. When a child of God takes a stand, Instead of being a pusillanimous, little weak-minded Christian that runs like a little wet puppy dog with his tail between his legs every time a great chasm or situation comes up and they get to the point where they want to give in, give up, and just cave in and quit. God don't have any whips in his army. God don't have pansies in his army. God has real men and real women with backbone like a crowbar that'll say, for God I live and for God I die. And the more you can Anything dealing with anything that's anti-God and you stand for Christ, the more powerful you become. Amen. The more of a threat you become, the more potent God's power resides within you. The more, the more you're in demand of the heavenlies. And every time you take a step anywhere, that's holy ground. It becomes holy ground. Why? Because of you. Your presence makes it holy ground. You say, well, 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 preacher, you don't understand. I'm struggling through some stuff. Man, I've been going through. It, it, who hasn't been struggling and going through? That's called Life 101. Yeah. The important thing is, about it is that you repent and brush yourself off and get back on a bandwagon and try not to go back and make the same old mistake over and over. Learn from it. Yeah. Grow from it and keep moving forward in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So now we're talking about this particular church called Philadelphia. Let me give you a little church history if you don't mind. I'm going to read a lot of this because I took some hours getting this thing together. Listen, if I, of all the churches that I have studied, when it comes to the churches dealing with the rebuke, man, that was easy for me to study <laughs> for some reason. But when it comes to the church that doesn't get really a rebuke from Jesus and, and they got all this eschatology teaching within this particular church, that's the church I had to put a lot of hours in to study and figure out, Lord, which angle am I going to approach this thing from? You know, I had to study. You got to study stuff and prepare yourself before you can teach somebody else something. And some of this stuff wasn't resonating in my spirit too well because I don't know a whole lot about eschatology. So I had to go into some real deep depths this week of prayer and study Amen. to get this down and understand a lot of this. Now, I'm going to try to bring it out the best as I can, but I'm not going to sit here and call myself a teacher of eschatology. Eschatology, by the way, is simply the doctrine of the last days. 
teaching about, about the last days doctrine. You know, when it comes to Revelation, it's an eschatology, eschatology book or something to that effect. And, and the book of Daniel is also a book of the last days or eschatology, if you will. Daniel and Revelation, those two books in the entire Bible are books dealing with the end times or the last days. So now when it comes to this sixth church of Philadelphia, this is a powerful church, a powerful revelation, a pretty long letter, and it's got some juicy, meaty stuff in it. So I can promise you I'm not going to finish it today. Amen. I will be preaching this next week as well. But this is going to be pretty much the first start of it. Let me just give you some history real quick. The city of Philadelphia was 28 miles southeast of Sardis. The city was a border town sitting at the borders of three different countries, Nicaea, um, you had Phrygia and Lydia. The road from Europe to the east came through Philadelphia, making it the gateway from one continent to the other. It was right there at the borderline of, uh, of Europe. The city was founded by uh, Eumenesi II of Pergamos, who really loved his brother Adelis, Philadelphus, so much that he named the city after him. This is in 50, 159 B.C. through 138 B.C. The epithet Philadelphia means brotherly love. So Philadelphia means one who loves his brother dearly or brotherly love. Because of its geography, the, Phil uh, the, the city of Philadelphia was founded as a doorway of opportunity because of open trade and commerce. There was also opportunity to spread the Greek culture and language to lands of the East. It did so well that its, it, that its task in 1980 was one of the neighboring countries, had for, they even forgot their own language because of the Greeks. And Eumenes designed and formed Philadelphia to be like one of the missionary cities and it was the last outpost of the Greek civil, civilization and of the Greek culture. It was upon the open door of commerce and trade and civilization for culture to pass from Asia into Asia Minor and into Assyria. This also gave the church there a strategic opportunity to fulfill God's mission for them to be an open door to spread the gospel to the surrounding areas. The city was very luxurious and it was known as Little Athens. The architect tech was so outstanding that they had a theater or Real big, huge stadium there and beautiful downtown district and surrounding the entire area of Philadelphia were wine vineyards, you know, and there was an agriculture business there dealing with the wine and grapes, of course, and it was dedicated to the god Dionysus because Dionysus was the Greek god of wine. So as a result... Uh, you know, they had a lot of reverie going on during this particular time and a lot of orgies because people feel good and happy and excited. And this was a part of their worship mode and so forth. And during Roman times, Dionysus was called Bacchus, which is also the god of the vine or the god that brings pleasure and so forth because of these orgies and all of these other things. Philadelphia was built on the edge of a great volcanic volcanic area which brought great prosperity to it because it was the most fertile area in the entire world because it was known for its vintages and again its wines. It also was known for hot springs which brought many people to the city to bathe because of its medicinal purposes and so forth. But that which brought prosperity to Philadelphia also brought much danger because it was built in a volcanic area, which meant the city was in constant danger of continual earthquakes. One earthquake in AD 70, in fact, was so powerful that it, it even destroyed Sardis. Remember when we talked about Sardis and we talked about in AD 17, Sardis was destroyed. It was because of the earthquake from Philadelphia, which is 28 miles away. That earthquake rocked Sardis and destroyed Sardis. Needless to say, it indeed destroyed the city of Philadelphia completely. And the Roman emperor, again, Tiberius, who was a very ungodly man, he gave the order for the city to be rebuilt, and he even financed it from a lot, a lot of the finances came from his own money. The rest of the funds were taken from the local citizens that were taxed heavily 
and the citizens became very poor because the city suffered with these earthquakes continually for the next 20 years. This city was shaking, 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 shaking all the time. It was shaking so violently, so often, that people didn't even want to go into the city of Philadelphia because of the ruins from the buildings. They thought that when the next, you know, aftershock would come, that some of these buildings would fall apart and, and, and cave in and crush and kill them. So they stayed out of the city and they started avoiding the entire city that had a major population. Everybody just left and just vacated because it was so dangerous and it was constantly shaken for the 20 year period after AD 17, constantly. About 20 years or so, that's when it started kind of mellowing out and stopped, you know, you didn't feel too many aftershocks afterwards. But that's a long time, mm -hmm. think about it. And eventually the Philadelphia church, would, uh, uh, the Phil city of Philadelphia would assume a missionary role, but Philadelphia remained a Roman town until 379 AD when it was seized by the Turks. That is the history of this particular church or the city that this church was in called Philadelphia. I want you all to do a favor for me right now. If you would open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Revelation chapter three. We're gonna take the time to actually read the letter to this particular church in Revelation chapter three. And it reads, verse seven, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Now remember, this is a personal letter from our Savior, Jesus the Christ. He's, he's, he's given this letter straight into the hands of John to deliver to this particular church. Of course, along with the other six churches as well. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. These things saith he that is holy. He that is true. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. Verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength. This in the Message Bible would read like this. You don't have much strength. I know that. You, you, you use what you had to keep my word. That's what he's saying. And he says, and has kept my word and has not denied my name. I think you're doing pretty good if you don't have any strength and you're still keeping the word and you still don't deny the name of Jesus. Amen. You're doing pretty good Amen. because many people or many churches that he, he has written to had the power and the strength and they denied the faith, denied the name, allowed corruption to come in, compromise to come in. They did everything wrong. But this church didn't even have the strength, yet they still held faithful to the name of the Lord and the word of Almighty God. Amen. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all of the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I will come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Amen. Let's look at verse seven again. It says, until the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth. Notice, he is holy. We serve a holy God. Amen. You cannot attach that word H-O-L-Y unto no, no other than Jesus Christ. Amen. Holiness belongs to Jesus. You can't put holy on any other deity or God. It was, the, it was from Jesus Christ that that word originated from. Amen. 
Everybody else copycatted off of that mm. and, and, and stole it. But listen, that word describes our Savior. He's holy. He's one of a kind. Mm -hmm. He's separate. He is sanctified. He's a part. He's, a, he's distant from everything else because he belongs totally to God. But yet he came down and took upon himself the form of a servant and was obedient, the Bible says, even unto death, comma, the death of the cross. Yeah, so he is holy alone. He is true. <clears throat> Jesus is true. Everything the Lord speaks is truth. Anything that comes out of the mouth of God is truth. You do understand that, don't you? Yeah. Do you realize God cannot lie? Amen. God is holy and he can't lie. Anything God says has to come to pass. Amen. Listen, God is so awesome and his word is so true that the Bible says that he's exalted his word above his own name. Yeah. So what he says, he does. He cannot lie. I am the Lord thy God. I change it not, saith the Lord. He can't lie. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, and said, Ye of your father the devil, the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his own language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Amen. Satan is the liar, not God. Amen. Satan is the master liar. He doesn't do anything but lie. When Satan tells you anything negative, it's a lie. When he says you're not going to make it, you need to shout. It means I'm getting ready to make it because what he's saying is a lie. Hallelujah. He just confirmed to me I'm going to make it. When he says you ain't nobody, it means you must be somebody because the devil's lying. Every time he opens his mouth, he's lying. If he tells you you're broke, get ready to shout. Money's coming on, around the corner for you. Amen. With your name on it. If the devil tells you you're sick and you're about to die, get ready to shout. Your head is right around the corner because everything the devil says is a lie. That's proof positive. You can shout behind that one. Somebody give his name glory right now. He's a liar, but when it comes to Jesus, he's the truth. Jesus is truth. Listen, truth comes from God. No other entity or deity or God, so to speak, can claim that other than our God, El Elyon, the Lord most high above all other gods, the God of all flesh. Jesus is the truth. That's why he said, I am the way, I am the truth, yes. and that I'm, I'm the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He really meant that. He is the truth. And Jesus stands and says, I am the one that's holy. I am the one that is true. And he that hath the key of David, what in the world is the key of David? Well, let me tell you a little bit about what the key of David is, because that's one of those mysteries I had to really do some sure enough digging into. Really digging into it. Then I got different commentators' opinions, and then I came before the presence of God and said, Now, Lord, what are you saying Amen. to me about this? Because I don't quite understand, because sometimes these opinions are conflicting opinions from different commentators. Mm -hmm. I didn't know which one to go with. I said, What exactly is the key of David? You said to the Church of Philadelphia, I hold in my hand the key of David. What is this key of David? What is it exactly? That same verse basically is a copycat off of another verse from Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. And it reads, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Notice that keys describe one that have, has uh, the power to open and to shut chambers. I mean, when it comes to different keys in the Old Testament. In this description in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, it refers to a person that has the power to open and close different chambers that house treasures, specifically. And he said that that particular man had the key of David to open the chambers of the treasures of David's kingdom. So he had the key. Now understand this. Jesus has the key ring with multiple keys on it. You remember, uh, I remember in high school, we used to have a high school janitor that would clean up the whole school. And sometimes you see these janitors with these big old, big gigantic ring with all these keys on it. 
And I would always, we, we would love, we loved the janitor at our high school. That guy was so nice and friendly to the students. We would love to tease with him at the school and after hours. He was such a nice guy, you know, and people would be in the classroom sometimes staying late and all that. And he would, you know, just say, I'll be right back when y'all finish or whatever. When people leave, he'd just come on in. But we had a good conversation with him. Always tease him. But he had a whole lot of keys. And sometimes, I think his name was Mr. Asher or something to that effect. I would say, Mr. Asher, what, what? I said, do you, under, do you really remember with all those keys which door every key opens. I said, man, you got like a, almost like a hundred keys on that chain. He said, believe it or not, I remember which one, every one. He said, certain keys have sizes, certain keys have colors, certain keys have shapes, and the ones that are identical, I put little dots and different little distinctions on them so that I can remember what key opens what. He was the man that had the keychain to the whole building of the school. The principal's office, everything. If you wanted to know where anything was and have access or entrance to any door in that school, inside or outside, that man, Mr. Asher, was the way to go. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus has the keys of everything you need. Everything you need to have access to any door that needs to be opened in your life, you need to go to the key man himself, the master key holder, Jesus the Christ. He has the key to everything in life, including the key of David. Let me tell you some other keys Jesus has. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus has the keys to the kingdom. He says, whatsoever you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on this earth, it shall be loosed in heaven. Why? Because I got the keys, my friend. And when you do it, I have access to knowing who you are. And I know that this is the door I can open. But for somebody else, that door won't come open. He only has access to those that he has a bias towards. If he likes you, he'll open the door. If he don't like you, he don't want you in there, he'll keep that door shut. Oh so he has the key. He has the keys to the kingdom. Luke chapter 11, verse 30, verse 52, he has the key of knowledge. Jesus holds in his hand the key of knowledge. Okay. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus has the keys of death and of hell. Yeah. Nobody goes through his fingers. Nobody can even go through hell except Jesus has the right to extend his hand or release them because he would look at their life because he has and he holds in his hands the keys of death, hell, and of the grave. Jesus has these keys. Satan can't take anybody out at random anytime he wants to, whenever he wants to. Don't just think that the devil just can snatch folk. He, he's got to go through the blood of Jesus first. Amen. Jesus has to permit that thing first. Sometimes things that God used or God ordained, and other times things are sent as a warning, and sometimes it's as a judgment. Amen. Depending on what situation you're in, but he, the devil has to go to Jesus for everything. He can't just, at freelance, just take somebody out whenever. Listen, the Bible says it's appointed till man wants to die. Yes. After that, the judgment. That appointed time has to come before the presence of God, before Jesus withdraws his hand for the spirit of death to come in and take that person out. It has to be permitted by Jesus first. Why? Because he holds in his hands yeah. the keys of death, hell, and of the grave. Yeah. And nobody can get past him. Mm -hmm. The devil has to bow down even now to Jesus. And later on, he's going to be bowing down even longer. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, has the key of David. And he also, in Revelation 9, 1, has the key of the bottomless pit or of the abyss. The bottomless pit. Jesus has all these keys. And if you ever want to go pass from one place where you are to the place that you need to be, then you've got to get a revelation of the key man himself. Amen. So you can understand what it is that I need. Now understand this. A key indicates control or authority. Therefore, having the key of David would give him control over David's dominion, which is the Jerusalem itself. It's the city of David and the kingdom of Israel. Because David had all of those under his belt. Because Jesus has the keys, it gives him reign and dominion over that right now. Jesus holds these keys, showing him that he's the fulfillment of the David, the Davidic covenant and the ruler of the new Jerusalem and the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. The Bible would say in the New Testament, Jesus, thou son of David. Why would he be called the son of David? Simply because David was a man after God's own heart. Yes. David loved God so, so very much yes. that God says, I'm going to establish your kingdom forever, David. Hallelujah. How is that possible when David's going to eventually die? Well, through his loins of lineage, Jesus Christ will be birthed. Amen. 
and he will be the one that has the kingdom that will be for an eternity because he would be called the son of David down the generations. That's how much of a good name David left in, uh, on the impression of the heart of Almighty God. Did David sin? Yes. When David sinned, he didn't go around piddling and paddling with little Mickey Mouse sins. David would do the big, gigantic, huge size sins. He sinned all the way sin kind of stuff. I'm talking about this kind of sin that would get you killed in a heartbeat. Those are the kind of, David didn't play around with his little tiny little mess. He had people's husbands killed. He did obedient acts. He did all disobedient acts. He did all kind of stuff. But guess what? The man, he faithfully repented every single time he screwed up. He repented. He asked God to cleanse him. Don't other people do it, but not like David. David wouldn't get off his face until God says, David, stand up, clean yourself up. Put on a new set of clothes. Get on out there and get back on that throne where you belong, man. Amen. David was faithful to repent every time he screwed up. He thought he got away with it one time. God had to send Nathan the prophet to expose David of his sin. Nathan gave him this, this particular analogy of a man that had several ewe lambs and so forth, you know, all these little animals in the backyard running around, seven of them, and a new neighbor moved in, and all he had was just one wife and one little ewe lamb. And the Bible says he loved his little ewe lamb, he loved that thing so much, it was like a part of the family. So the man next door was sitting around getting ready to prepare a big feast for all his guests that were coming over. He had seven ewe lambs in the back of his yard, but no, he can't kill any of those seven. They are all precious to him. So he goes over to the man's fence that had the one little ewe lamb, steals the man ewe lamb when he's got seven, but he didn't care, stole that man's one ewe lamb, cut him up, and served him for dinner when the company came. And that man is now without his little ewe lamb, and all he's got left is his wife, nothing else. And this man stole the little bit he did have. Because David killed a man. He killed Bathsheba's husband. You know, um, what's that guy's name? Uriah. 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 Killed Uriah. Had him killed. Gave a letter to, you know, uh, his, his, his head chief in command, the captain and so forth. And, and, and he went on and put him on a front line and he lost his life in the war. And he turned around and married Bathsheba to cover his sin because he had slept with the woman who was already married. Yeah. And David already had seven wives. Yeah. And he thought he got away with that sin. He, he married her, had a, get Uriah killed, now he's out of the picture, so he married her, tied up his loose ends, and now he's sitting back on the throne judging Israel. And all of a sudden, God sends Nathan and says, you know, let me tell you this little story. He tells him the whole story, and then when David heard that, David said, you mean to tell me that man that has seven ewe lambs stole that one little ewe lamb from this person? He said, that man needs to be put to death! <laughs> Nathan said, thou art the man. When he told David that, David realized, oh my God, he's talking about me. And he dropped his head and repented. And he cried for days and cried for weeks, actually, and cried and booed. Those are the times he wrote the Psalm, Psalm 51, purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, God, and I should be white as snow. Create me a clean heart, oh God. Okay. Renew a right spirit in me, God. Oh God, my, my sin is ever before me. I mean, he repented. He repented. His firstborn had to die. God had to take him through death. That's why God had to encourage him to eat something. Wash yourself. Put on a new set of clothes. Get back out there. You've bewailed enough. Now it's time to judge Israel. God had to strengthen him. But David was a praiser. He was a warrior. He was the same one that would raise the sheep in the field. And the lion came and he put his life on the line even for those sheep. And he took the line and broke his jaw in half. And then a bear came and he broke his jaw in half. So David had a good heart. And God says, he's a man after my heart. Yes, yes. Though he's got sin in his life, he is faithful to repent. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Yes. How if you mess up, if you've blown it miserably, yes. if you simply humble yourself before the presence of God in an act of repentance. Yes. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians seven twelve, godly sorrow produces salvation Hallelujah. unto repentance. Yes. Godly sorrow. Yes. He humbled himself. He repented. And he would serve God and write new psalms. This man was a warrior. He was a king. He killed many people and won victoriously fights, fights in battle. He took 318 raggedy, busted, broke, busted, madly, uh, mad at the world, totally disgusted folk, and he turned their lives around. Yes. 
and trained these 318 million men. And out of these 318, 30 of them were called mighty men that David himself trained because he was a warrior. Oh, yeah. You had men that could, you know, uh, yeah. you know, shoot a eyeball out of an eagle from, from miles away. <laughs> if you could believe that. <laughs> Some kind of skills they had. I mean, one man had a sword that he killed so many people, they had to pry the sword out of the man's hand. They had to pry it out of his hand. One time David just thought, Lord, if I just had some water, I'm so thirsty. They had men that would go through, you know, bows and arrows and all kind of rocks and stones, and they were just going, and they came and got David some water. And he went through all of that just to give the man and God some water. Simply because he said, I'm so thirsty. Put their lives on the line. And when David got the water, David was the kind of man that, instead of him looking at all these other thirsty men and just drinking, boop, 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 thank you for the water. I appreciate that sacrifice you made for me. No. David sat and saw the fact that these men would do something like that for him as a king. He took the water and poured it out. Said, I can't do that because they sacrificed their lives for me, a nobody. That's how David thought. That's because he was such a humble man when he came to serving God, a man after God's own heart. Somebody that would have the keys to this man, that means you're somebody of notoriety because David had a good report when it came to God. He had a good name, but guess what? Who else can stand the test of time and have an excellent name like that other than our Savior Jesus. On, Jesus now holds the keys of David in his hand. He has the keys of David. Jesus does. Think about it. The key of David message is actually Christ's gospel. Believe it or not. The good news he brought when he came to earth. It gives you a specific understanding of the gospel and it adds a royal dimension. The first fruits. Those saints called out before Christ's second coming will share the throne of David with Christ during the millennial period. That's the thousand year reign. They're going to share that same throne. This is God's most highly exalted goal. He's recreating himself in mankind and David understood that and he repented and obeyed God and he passionately, passionately submitted to God. That's why David's name is here in Revelation chapter 3 because God's plan is to teach every person who has ever lived to submit and repent like David. Like David. Amen. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Of the increase of his government, referring to Jesus Christ, it says of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with his justice, his righteousness from the time forth and forevermore. We're talking about the hands and the keys being in the hand of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 1 verse 32. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Jesus has the key of David. Now when you got a key, you got to do something with the key. That's something you got to do with the key. And it says, verse 7, And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. He that does what with this key? Openeth, and no man shutteth. He that does what else? Shutteth, and no man openeth. Then verse 8, the first part of verse 8, he says, I know thy works. Referring to the church of Philadelphia, I know your works. Then he goes and says, Behold, I have set before you an open door. Remember, I got the keys. And as the master of the keys, I've unlocked some doors and I've caused them to be open instead of closed. And I've set before you open doors. He said it. And he says that no man can shut it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. RPM ministry. Those that are joined together with this particular ministry. God told me to tell you this. He set before you an open door. Hallelujah. Got good news for you. No man can shut it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory Let me say that again. Glory RPM, the Lord specifically in prayer told me to tell you. I have set before RPM Church open doors and no man can close. Did you get it? God has set before you an open door. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. You don't know what you're saying. I tried it before. I tried that three or four years ago. Man, look, that is hard as out of the world. You don't know all the stuff you got to go through, man. The overhead. You don't know all the stuff involved. You don't. Listen, listen. And then the people weren't even budging. They didn't 
want to come down on the pray. They didn't want to give in. They didn't want to compromise. They want to be quiet. God says, I have set before you an open door. What didn't work in the past is because the door was closed in the past. But God said, now I have set before you an open door. Let me give you proof positive. Proof positive. When I first came to this lot, to look at this church before we walked in this church building, I had long, I had seen six or seven, maybe even eight or nine other churches over a three-month period of time by different realtors. Some were cheaper than this price, but they just didn't seem like they would jail with my spirit. I didn't feel the anointing. I didn't feel the, oh, the green light. I didn't feel the go-ahead, if you will. But when it came to this church, they wanted about $7,500 a month for rent because it was two suites tied together. This used to be a family dollar store, and next to it was a chiropractor center. There was a big wall separating the two, and they wanted to sell both of them together as one package deal, 7,500 bucks a month. Where are you gonna get $7,500 a month? I just barely got enough money to even work on a church, let alone the off. Listen, how in the world am I gonna pay that kind of money when it, when it comes to a church that's newly launched? Yeah. That don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even really have a congregation yet. Did everything by faith. So I came to this church and I prayed about it and I called the people because the Holy Spirit said, call them up. The Holy Spirit said, call them up. I looked at the Mims company phone number, called them up. They turned me down. My question is, why did you have me call them, Jesus? Why did you have me waste my time? I thought I was hearing from heaven. If it, was, if it were you, then it would have been a you know positive report. Instead, it's a negative report. 7500 bucks a month. What am I to do with that? The Lord said, just praise me anyhow. So I continued to praise the Lord, and then all of a sudden, now I'm trying to think which one of these churches out of these diff different churches can we afford, because some of them were very, very small. Some were, you know, really, really small. Others were just real huge and asking way, way too much money a month. But this, this one was the right size because it was a whole big, huge, open warehouse and all of this. But it just, you know, it just didn't have... I couldn't start off paying $7,500 a month. I don't know how many people are going to pay tithes. I don't know how faithful they're going to be. I don't know how long they're going to last. You know, that's a lot to pay for every month. That's just the rent, not including what they call CAM. CAM is where you are attached to a plaza, and one company owns everything. So you have to share utilities, and you have to share water bills. And anytime they pay the parking lot, I have to pay a percentage of them paying the parking lot. Though I'm renting. I'm not owning. I'm not buying. I'm just simply renting. That's called CAM, you know? And you have to pay all these extra fees, you know, apart from the rent. So when you add that, sometimes the CAM insurance itself can be $2,700 a year, added on to the rent. And that, that's not including your utilities as your light and your gas. That's not including that. It does, it does CAM covers the water, but it doesn't include lights or gas. So all of this is, to, you know, I'm sitting here, how in the world are we going to juggle this? So I said, okay, you know, forget it. So I went home sort of almost discouraged, but then I, I, I had to sing songs to Jesus. Yeah. Get in his presence to build myself up to my most holy faith. Yeah. I got hooked up to the power source. Come on, come on. How many know whenever you're out of strength, whenever you're out of power, yeah. you need to get hooked up. Yeah. This church, the Bible says, had little strength. Yeah. Yeah. He says, but yet you did Just one thing, because keep in mind, there's no such thing as a perfect church. The church of Philadelphia did not get a rebuke like these other churches got. These other churches got terrible rebukes. The only other church that didn't get a rebuke was another church called the Church of Smyrna, who was the persecuted church that was getting persecuted and killed left and right. They were faithful, and they were just faithfully dying as soldiers and as warriors without opening their mouths to speak against Jesus, boldly going before their death with their heads held up high, dying for Jesus Christ's sake. He didn't rebuke that church at all. Neither did he rebuke this church of Philadelphia. But all the rest of them got a rebuke. But let me tell you something, Philadelphia wasn't a perfect church because you got to ask the question, why were you weak? Amen. Mm -hmm. Why were you weak? Didn't the Bible say his strength is made perfect in weakness? Well, where was God's strength if you're about to give up and you're weak? Where is the strength? Didn't the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord. That's the command. You have the power to become strong. If I'm weak, I'm out of strength. How can I be strong? I have no more strength. It's not my strength. 
that I'm strong in is his strength. I have a responsibility and an obligation as a believer to, to come to my senses to know that when I'm weak, I'm vulnerable. When I'm weak, I'm easily susceptible to falling into temptation. When I'm weak, the devil can knock me out and take advantage of me and cause me to sin. It's not doing your high times. It's not doing your mountaintop experiences that the devil comes and tempts you. It's doing your valley experiences, my friend. When things look bad and when you let your guards down and you stop fighting, you take a chill pill, you kick back and you relax like David did when he won that great big battle and everybody was excited in Israel and David chilled out on top of the house. He had his little pina colada there sip, sipping his virgin pina colada on the housetop with his shades on, you know, probably read one of his psalms that he had written unto the Lord, praising Almighty God until this beautiful fine thing over here got his attention, taking a bath. He looked over there and said, whoa, whoa, my God, didn't see something. God sent her to me. That's when he was most vulnerable after a victory. That's when he let his guards down. After a great win, that's when we chill out and relax. We become more vulnerable. Your strength is out. That's when the enemy comes in and slips in and then takes us out because of our vulnerability. He blindsides us. And that church was without strength. But my question is, why didn't they regenerate the power? Then the, then the Bible says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Church, what happened to your strength? Thank God for the letter because had that letter not come in time, they probably would have ended up sinning. But just in time, Jesus delivered them and said, you got little strength, you're weak, but you still don't have anything I got to complain about because even in your weakness, you're still taking a stand for me. But you got to understand when you're down and out, when your strength is gone, you need to go to the rock that is higher than you are. You need to bow down to the rock called Jesus the Christ. Listen, when insurmountable problems and situations, when you get things that are turned down in your life, Doors that are shut closed in your face. Yes. That's not the time to have a pity party. That's not the time to go in the house and contemplate how you're going to take yourself out and commit suicide. That's not the time to sit there and go war as me and get all depressed and walk around like a doggone chicken with his head down. That's the time, child of God, to stand before the Lord's presence and to say, God, speak to my heart, oh Lord. Your servant, hear thee. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's what the Bible says when in your weakness, your strength is made perfect because you are against the wall. All your strength is gone. Your dependency at that point is upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the miracle starts in. That's when God overturns mountains and moves mountains and makes the crooked way straight in your life. Somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. These are the times that the saints of God run to the rock. We get hooked up to the power source. Jesus Christ. Plug into him. Let his electrical current flow through you. Because when you're out of your strength, thank God you're out of the way now. Now you can get a full dose of Jesus Christ with no flesh involved. Somebody shout glory to God. That's what we mean by that. And see, God has given Jesus the keys of David and he's also opened some doors. He's opened some doors. Hallelujah. Jesus told me to tell you that there are some Hallelujah. doors that God has opened. Do you know that this Lord, is the black Lord, woman's Lord. time, it seems? Many, many people, first of all, women were second-class citizens. And then of the two races of women, black women were always held in the background. But if you notice, everybody that's a black woman now, it's like the door of black women have been opened all across America. Have you noticed that? We have women mayors now, women governors, women chiefs, chief of police.
what it's an opportunity. That's what it is. When the door is wide open, it's time for you to seize the moment. Hallelujah. You need to seize it. Amen. You need to Amen. seize it. Amen. All of what you need has already been in that provision package. Yeah, yeah. If you open the door, that means the package has been opened and everything. Oh. When I came to this church, they wanted 7,500 bucks. No, they said. So I went back home, got in the power source to encourage myself and the Lord, get pumped up again. And then all of a sudden, a couple of months passed. Now we're coming to the month of January of 2017. And in January of 2017, I called, came right back to the same parking lot, looked at that same phone number, called this church again, spoke to the same person. They said, did you call a couple of months ago? I said, I certainly did. I said, you're the one that quoted me that ridiculous price, weren't you? <laughs> I said, well, you know what? I'm a citizen here in Douglasville, Georgia. I said, I noticed this place has been closed down for four and a half years. I said, listen, ain't a little something better than a whole lot of nothing? I said, wouldn't you, if you cut that price in half for me, wouldn't you make some money, a profit, if you cut the price in half, uh, you know, rather than sitting up here trying to be hard baller and not want to give in and all this kind of stuff. I said, you have something coming in rather than this place just sitting here vacant, you know, molding all this, you know, stuff collecting and stuff. I said, you need somebody in this building. I said, and I'm willing to go halfway with you. And I said, no, sir, we can't do that. I said, okay, well, goodbye. Boom. <laughs> and I heard, I heard the Holy Ghost say, praise me anyhow. So all the way home, on the way home, it takes me six to seven minutes to leave this church to get to my house. Amen. On the way home, before I could get home, I get a phone call back from this same lady. <laughs> Mr. Blackshear. Yes, ma'am. How much did you say you would want to offer again? I gave her the price. Then she added a couple of more hundred onto it. <laughs> and said, if we could do that, maybe we got ourselves a deal. I said, let me think about it. Yep, let's do it. <laughs> My wife and I signed the papers February 1st, 2017. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here we are right now. Going on our fourth anniversary. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. Going on our fifth anniversary. Hallelujah. May of this year, May 21st, will be our anniversary here at this church. May 21st this year will be, will mark four years going on our fifth year that we've been here. See, that door was closed at first. It was closed. It was closed. And a lot of y'all feel like, well, you know, I tried it, but, but, but don't, don't give up. Delay is not denial. Amen. Delay is not denial. Yeah. It means not now. It means wait. It means trust me. It means don't go freaking out, cussing your day, you know, going around, you know, you say, oh, it's darkness all around me. Everywhere I go, but shut up and light a candle, praise God. Won't be dark no more. Your back. Yeah. He's giving you a wide open door. Yeah. I told you, he's telling me to tell you that the door is open. Hallelujah. The business you try, try now oh, and see what happens. Yeah. And if it's a no, and you say, well, my pastor said try now, but shoot, the door's still closed. Shut up and praise God. Yeah. God's yeah. cooking something up. God will back his word up. He don't lie. I told you, he exhausts his word above his name. God told me to tell you, he has set before our PM an open door of opportunity. No man can shut it. Why? Because Jesus got the keys in his hand. Particularly the key of David. He says, you're, you're of royal lineage, child of God. You go for it. It's your time. It's your time. You need to take the brakes off and stop with the fear mechanism. Because the opportunity of the lifetime only lasts as long as the lifetime of the opportunity. It means that it has a birth date and it has a death date. That door won't be open forever. Amen. There's a time when the doors are going to be closed. Did you know that this church of Philadelphia, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll I get right back there in a second. Let me read Acts chapter 14, verse 27. <laughs> Paul says this. He says, and when it came, and when we were, uh, when we, uh, when they would come, he says, he gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. I said, Paul wrote this, Luke wrote this. Luke wrote that X, trust me, Luke was the writer. And he says that how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. The door of the Gentiles, the Gentiles were called heathens, heathen nations. They believed in different other gods. They didn't think about Jesus. They weren't even thinking about nothing but Jesus. Anybody that would mention Jesus sometimes would have instant death until Jesus said it. 
his foot on this planet and he opened that door with his keys. Remember, he's the key holder. Jesus took one of those keys. I said, click, click. I'm getting ready to open this door. He says, now y'all going in there and the door is open. And Christians were able to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Yeah. And they, they got their uh, ears wet with the gospel and the Holy Ghost came upon the Gentiles. Yeah. They were engrafted yeah. into the family of God. They became spiritual Israel. Because Judaism was where God had a group of people called the Jews. It was God and his people, the Jews, Israel. But when you become born again, you become spiritual Israel because a Gentile is anyone that's not a Jew, particularly Hebrew by birth. Any nationality, black, white, Asian, African American, uh, I mean Indian, you name it, all in the whole, everybody that wasn't a Jew was called a Gentile. So that doorway was wide open. Did you know that God took the walls uh, down in all diff different places? That even in the uh, area of Philadelphia, they had access to Europe and Assyria and all these different countries and continents. And, and, and this was the only one of the only churches of all seven churches where you see them going out ministering the gospel because everybody else was running for their lives because of the heavy duty persecution. But God had given them an open door to preach. So one out of the seven churches was the evangelistic church that got the gospel message out. Amen. Everybody else had it within the four walls. But this one had an opportunity to go out to the different parts and open their mouths and let these Greeks know and these Romans know that Jesus was Lord. Yes, they were still crucified and, and persecuted. Yes, they still lost their lives. And that's why many of them were weak because of all the death that was around them. Yet they kept going and never denied the name and kept preaching even unto death in some cases, because God had given them an open door. Amen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 7 through 9, For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to see you a while, to, to, to stay with you a while later, if the Lord permits. He says, But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has been opened for me, and there are many adversaries. Notice, Paul says, God has opened a big, major door for me. He had a vision with Macedonia who had a door where that was closed. He saw a dream of a man in Macedonia saying, come over here, come over here. And that door was open all of a sudden. And he was, oh, there were other doors that were open. But in the midst of these open doors, Paul had the audacity to say, but though the door is open, I got adversaries on every end. God didn't tell you the door was going to be open and you're just going to go waltzing through there free without any kind of complication. Amen. It means even though the door is open, you're going to have complications. You're going to have haters. You're going to have adversaries. You're going to have those that like the crap mentality, want to pull you back down, lie on you and, you know, defame you and slander your name. You're going to have those even in the midst of the, of the open door. You're going to have adversaries. It comes with the territory. Beautiful roses. How many love roses? Smell wonderful. Smell beautiful. They're beautiful flowers. They have thorns. Thorns come with roses. You get pricked. You can get cut and bleed because of roses. Because they're beautiful, but they have thorns. Depends on how you look at it. Some people say thorns have roses. Others say roses have thorns. Depends on your perspective. But I'm here to tell you, there's going to be some adversary behind this thing. And God is in control of this thing because he has given us an open door. Somebody say an open door. Open door. Say it like you mean it. An open door. An open door. In, the, in, 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 in this 20th century, during the church era of Philadelphia, this was, the, this was the opportunity for open doors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want y'all to understand a little bit about church history. Let me just break this down as I come to a close because this is all I can get out today. The rest of it I'm going to have to pump out next week. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that God has set before us an open door of opportunity. Listen, an open door of opportunity. I hope y'all get this. Some of y'all I got to pray for after this service. I'm going to have y'all come down here because God's told me by name to call certain people out and y'all are here. And I got to call y'all down and pray for you because God specifically has a door of opportunity. And let me say this. You are in your own way. Your own doubt messes your whole opportunity up. 
your fears. You're not having the faith to trust God is what is your worst enemy. You, the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. God has opportunities that he's open. Now listen to this. During this particular time, I don't know if I can start and finish it, but let me just say this. I told you that the seven churches existed during the time of Christ, but they were also emblematic of the seven different church eras that the body of Christ at large would go through over a period of history. So you, you know how, for instance, during the time of um, John, the, the church of Ephesus was alive and well. That was the church that, left, that they left their first love, the church of Ephesus. And then you had a period right at the turn of the first century, you know, right around 95 AD, 100 AD, and so forth, where the church for 231 years went through the most traumatic uh, persecution. Jesus even said to the church of Smyrna, y'all are going to have uh, a tough time for 10 days. And that wasn't to be taken literal, but those 10 days represented 10 waves of demonic emperors that would be raised up from the pit of hell. That would cause the Christians to be tormented and be persecuted and, and just kill Christians off left and right. Jesus said, y'all gonna go through this for 10 days with the 10 major peers. It took 231 years for them to go through all this persecution, all that stuff, and they were halfway killed out. Then after the church of Smyrna, then you have this great, huge, big, giant church that steps up called the church of Pergamum. That's the church on the big high hill, the mountain, where the seat of Satan sat, Zeus. What is the, the god Zeus had a big, huge monument and altar erected to him, and they killed a polycarp, one of God's number one evangelists. They roasted him alive inside the belly of a, a bronze bull, right where the, the, the tomb of Zeus was. He died as a martyr for Christ. And then that was called the compromising church because the Christians that started compromising. And then after the compromising church, then we have this church that was called Thyatira that rose up. Thyatira was just a garrison that was a city that was there to protect people from going into Pergamum. But they set up a church at the base of Thyatira. And this was the corrupt church where the woman Jezebel sat and taught the children of God to go ahead and mingle with false gods and idolatry and practices. Go ahead and mingle with that. Then right after that, you got a church that just flat, straight up died. Right after that, the church of Sardis. They were a dead church. Right, right when you start compromising, then that's when corruption comes in and then, boom, inevitably death. Because Sardis just flat was the deadest church. Thought they had it going on, but they were dead. They died. Then all of a sudden, right out of the ashes, you know, right from the ashes, the phoenix rises out of the ashes, and you get a church called Brotherly Love, Philadelphia, that says, we'll be obedient. Hallelujah. We're weak as water, but we'll still hold on with a little bit of strength we've got. Jesus said, that's my church. That's my church. That's my church. I have set before you, Philadelphia, an open door. Now, now, let's go back. Let's go back. During the reign of the corrupt church, which happens to be the Pergamus, I mean the uh, com the compromising church, what happens to which happens to be the Pergamus church, that reign in the church era of history took place in 500 A.D. and it lasted from 500 A.D. all the way up to 1500 A.D. During that period of time, it was called the compromising church. You know why? Because the Romans, who used to hate the Christians, that would kill the Christians. Way back in 313 uh, A.D., they were getting ready to take over all of, you know, the whole country and stuff. And then there was an emperor that God himself raised up by the name of Constantine. And Constantine was a Christian that saw a vision of a sword and a cross. And he gave his heart to the Lord God. And the next thing you know, Constantine said that we're going to adopt, because he's a Roman, we're going to adopt Christianity as our religion. And how many know that the Romans believed in idols and paganistic beliefs? And they took their doctrine and they mixed it in with Christianity, the very thing Jesus hates. You can't mix anything with Christianity. Yeah, it's alone by itself. It's the word of God. It's the plan and the ways of God. You don't mix it with nothing. Yeah, right. And mixture is what Jesus hates. And that's called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans because it gives you reference of how Balaam caused Balak caused Balaam to go out and curse the 
children of Israel when he couldn't curse them because God blessed them. So he caused them to mingle with the uh, uh, people of Moab so that they could commit whoredom with them and then serve their false gods, mix in with their false mixture. Jesus hates mixture. He hates mixture. He's pure all by himself. He don't need no help. He said, don't add to, don't take away. This is a, a special kind of breed. This is a gospel message from the throne of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one jot nor tittle will pass away from God's word. You don't add to it. You don't take away. You can't mix it. And out of that, you had all of this 1,000-year period where the Roman church mixed in with Christianity called the Roman Catholic. They had a kingdom set up on this planet, you know, where they had a father figure like God in heaven known as the Pope. It was called the Papal. This was the, this was the ordinance or the, you know, different uh, regiments that they had, the leadership, the, the Papal. You had the Pope, you had the Cardinals, you had the bishops, then you had the monks, then you had the nuns, you had all of this kind of stuff going on, and it was a thing when you go up to this man, you kiss him like he's God, and you bow down to him, and he's the Pope, and he exonerates you of your sin, and then in case you do sin and go to hell, you can pray that person's soul out of this place called purgatory, you know, and you pay him a fee, and they'll keep praying for your dead relative who's went to hell, and they ain't coming back from hell, but they told you a lie and said that you can buy their soul out of hell by giving the church some money. It was the way the church made money off of people. So they were rich because a lot of folk went to hell. Church was racking up. So because of that, thank God, you would think. Now remember, remember the church of Acts in the book of Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Ghost came in, man, and God burned that place down with fire from on high. Not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense where these drunken men came out on fire for Jesus Christ. Paul, a Peter preached his first message to the whole world that came as witnesses to listen to everybody speaking their own uh, language. And they were amazed at that. And Peter preached and 3,000 souls got saved in one shot. That's a mega church right there. Then he went on to another location. Five more thousand added to the 3,000. You got 8,000 folks saved. The gospel spread like wildfire. Then the devil had the audacity to put his foot in a stronghold down on the church for a thousand years where it was mixed in with the Roman Catholic Numb mumble jumble nonsense my God, my God. of paganistic worship. I don't mean to offend anybody that's Roman Catholic, but I'm only telling you the truth, sir or ma'am. Right. Read your Bible, you'll see it, it's in there. So that was a period of just corruption. And then you had a period of death that took place right after the corruption, which is the church of death, Sardis. Between 1500 to 1800 was the dead period. Those are called the dead years. Isn't that amazing? In history, they would call that name. I mean, that, was, that was when the church era of Sardis went on for 300 years during the dark ages of history. And where it was deadness. And out of the midst of the ashes rose up one of the monks from the Catholic Church that saw a vision of Jesus and said, enough is enough. I'm sick of this church. They ain't preaching this gospel right. They ain't got but one man up here telling everybody what to do. No other copies of the Bible. Not only that, but he's the only one that got the copy. And it's written in Latin. Nobody understands Latin. But this man understood Latin because he taught himself how to speak Latin, interpreted it, and said, y'all are off base. I'm going to take these 95 theses and I'm going to knock them on the door of Germany. Praise God. And I'm going to say, this stuff stinks. We're not having that. Me and some of my friends got together. We're going to protest against this. We're going to break out with a new religion called Protestants. Mm. Protestants were birthed. Protestants. And they split from the Roman Catholic Church during that period of time. And during this particular period of time, in 1800 A.D., woo, was when the new church was born Amen. in history called the Church of Philadelphia. That's when the Church of Philadelphia was born because of Martin Luther. And as a result of Martin Luther, the Lutheran Church was birthed. Then you had John Calvin, the Calvinistic Calvinist Church was birthed. You know, Calvins and Lutherans and so forth. You know, and then you had these different theologies that came along. The Baptists came along. The Presbyterian came along. The Methodists came along. The Anglican Church came along. All because of this protest against the Roman Catholic Church. And then his doctrine said that each person should be able to get a copy of the Bible in a language that they can understand, read it themselves and live this thing the way Jesus Christ intended it to be. Yeah. This is when the church of Philadelphia was birthed. Yeah. Hallelujah. All 
Remember, Philadelphia is the open, do the open door church. Amen. And during this time, you had this great awakening. Somebody shout awakening. Awakening. This, between this time, going all the way back to the church in the book of Acts, those were thousands of years that had passed. Almost 2,000 years, not quite, but almost 2,000 years had gone by of dryness, corruption, compromise, deadness. Nobody preached salvation. Nobody preached about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody talked about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Nobody got saved. He just joined the church. Nobody had an experience with God. You didn't see nobody, no signs, no wonders, no gifts of the spirit while in operation. Nobody was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. None of that existed for years. Until Martin Luther had the audacity to come up with the Re Reformation. And when the Re Re Reformation took off, you had, the whole world was spread through the Roman Catholic Church. And that influence on the whole world. Everybody started protesting and hanging on with the Protestant faith. And different denominations kicked in and started. And then you had the people from England to come to the United States of America. And a, a guy by the name of Charles Parham started a Bible uh, teaching class out of a house. And he was sitting there in Los Angeles, California, preaching the gospel. And this man, who was a, crop, a sharecropper's son, he was a one-eyed preacher that had smallpox. His name was William Seymour, a black man, sat there on the outside of the uh, uh, doors listening to this gospel message. Because when Parham was preaching, the Jim Crow law said that black folks couldn't be in the same class as white people Amen. to listen to anything. So he sat outside and listened through a cup through the door and got a hold of a message. And then he went to 212 Bonnie Bray, Bray Street in Los Angeles, California and started his own Bible study. And a few people he had, a little pianist and a couple other folk were praying and fasting and seeking God. And my God, they got a hold of a scripture in the book of Acts that said the Holy Ghost came with fire as a rushing mighty wind and the field of the house were all ascended. They appeared to them cloven tongues like in a fire and sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them others. Somebody shout hallelujah. They got on fire, went on the 10-day fast. The third day, one of the preachers said, hey, William Seymour, lay your hands on me. Yeah. If it happened to them in the Bible days, yeah. it can happen to me right now. When he laid hands, the man fell out of his seat, rolled around on the floor and started speaking in tongues. The pianist lady was trying to keep up. The Holy Ghost hit her. She fell back. She started speaking. Somebody shout, glory to God. Then it was noise to brought everybody in the neighborhood started hearing about this thing called glossolalia, which was tongues. And everybody, black, white, Asian, Jew, Indian, came on the outside of this house and they were listening to this black man on the porch preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So many folk came that the porch fell in because of the weight of the people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Glory. Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Needless to say, the fire yes, trucks came. Lord. Yes. People came from distances because there was seen from miles away a fire that came upon the house and it couldn't be contained or put out because it wasn't a regular kind of fire you used to put out. This is the Holy Ghost fire that came on this house. They had to go rent a barn stable on a street called Azusa Street in downtown LA where the horses and the cows used to sit there and be fed and so forth. They rented this little church out called the Apostolic Faith Mission. And my God, this man had people from all over the world yeah. to come yeah. to serve Jesus Christ yeah. as Lord and Savior. Yeah. Black folks, white folks, Jews, Gentiles, everybody from all walks of life came Lord. to Lord. hear the gospel message Hallelujah. preached by a one-eyed black powerhouse of a man of God, Amen. William Seymour. During this time, and then I'm coming to a close. The plane is coming down to the runway. Landing right now. During this time, you had mighty men of God raised up. John Calvin, you know, John Knox, who was a pro Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, and Charles Finney, he was the leader of the Second Reformation, and C. H. Spurgeon, John Wesley, who was a powerful man of God that said, I set myself on fire and people come out to watch me burn. Hallelujah. What kind of testimony is that for a preacher? A powerful one, I tell you that. Yeah, Listen yeah, to this. Yeah. And William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, got saved Hallelujah. and started helping out the poor people and homeless and so forth. And still going on today. D.L. Moody started the Moody Bible Institute. Billy Sunday. And then, of course, I'm, I'm being biased. 
because I came from the Pentecostal background. You had from the Pentecostal movement, William Seymour, who founded this thing. And my God, you had different other denominations that broke out. You had the Church of Christ that broke out of the Pentecostal movement, the Church of God in Christ, Kojic. You know, you had the Church of Christ worldwide and P-A-W, Pentecostal Assembly of the World. Then you had the, the Church of Christ Holiness, and William uh, Charles, uh, Charles Christ, who sang some of those great songs that we sing in the hymnals. You had all kind of things. Then you had the Assemblies of God to break out, the Four Square Church. All that came out of the Holy Ghost Revival in 1906 on Azusa Street. My God. And then you had all these great, powerful men and women of God to come out. Smith Wigglesworth, F.F. F. Bosworth, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, Billy Graham, A.A. A. Allen, R.W. Shambach, Jack Cole, Benson Idiosa, who brought Pentecost to Nigeria, Africa. That was Bishop Etedia's spiritual father whose hands were laid on him. Benson Idiosa, oh, Idiosa, oh, oh. Yeah, Adahosa. <laughs> Benson Adahosa, Bishop Benson Adahosa raised over 15 people from the dead. Bishop Etedia raised about six of them from the dead himself. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm just waiting for my time to raise somebody from Amen. the dead. It's coming. I guess we're talking about spiritual dead right now, but that's all right. We ain't talking about y'all that are present. Hallelujah. We're not even talking about the ones that are We're talking about other folks over else. Jack Cole, Benson Idiosa, Oral Roberts, Kenneth Hagen, Fred Price, Mara Cirillo, Ron Hart Bucky. Whom I had the pre pleasure of meeting with. And then Charles C. Blackshear. Oh, oh, oh wait, wait, who's that? Who's that? Come on, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. church that started in 1959 and that church is the present day church now we're going to talk about them next time Absolutely. but next week we got to finish on philadelphia y'all amen because god if y'all give me just can y'all give me a few minutes come on with it if y'all give me a few minutes i can finish philadelphia right now come on with it and we can just start on the last church next week let's do it man. let's do it <laughs> you know glory, what glory I'll wait. To god. <laughs> i got too much more to talk about <laughs> But before I leave, I want to get back in the spirit right here, seriously. Amen. I want to call some of you all up right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Ghost put it in me to call you all up. Now, if I don't call you up, don't get upset with me. Don't say, well, I understand it. Why didn't he call them and didn't call me? I'm just telling you, when I was in my prayer closet, I saw these faces. And God gave me specific instruction for these individuals. I want you all to come right here to this altar. Meet me at this altar. George, you're heading on up this way right now. You're one of them. In fact, you leave the pack. You were the first one. I want you front and center, sir. You ready to catch some folk. And that guy gonna have to have somebody to catch you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Have your way, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way. I want y'all to be praying in the spirit here. I want you to know, sir. You doubt your own self. God showed me. I pray for you. There are doors that are open. You're